Today I'm going to give a talk titled Recognizing Dementia Using Routine MRI. These are my disclosures. I won't uh, try to sell anyone uh, anything related to any of these disclosures today. An overview of this talk, uh, basically we're going to try to understand how we can use uh, routine MR or CT to detect uh, patterns that are suggestive of underlying uh, dementia syndromes. And dementia in general is kind of defined as uh, decline in multiple cognitive domains. Uh, most patients who have cognitive impairment or dementia are likely to have underlying Alzheimer's disease pathology. And again, my focus is really to teach you how to recognize uh, patterns that may redirect uh, clinical evaluation of certain patients. Uh, most of the time, the imaging is not necessarily diagnostic, uh, but can be very suggestive for particular underlying neurodegenerative conditions. And this is a tremendous problem in the United States that is likely to become even more significant in the next uh, 10 to 15 years. The baby boom population is now reaching sort of peak age uh, for developing cognitive impairment and dementia. Uh, because of improvements in survival, more people are living to be 70, 80, or even 90 years old, uh, where the prevalence of underlying neurodegenerative conditions is much higher. And uh, in my own state of New York, you can see that the percentage of elderly is increasing uh, dramatically over the next 10 to 20 years. This uh, is important to, to highlight uh, the prevalence of dementia. Uh, we often uh, give many lectures on how to read glioblastoma correctly and how to uh, predict whether uh, we're looking at treatment changes or recurrence. Uh, it's worth keeping in mind that dementia is a thousand times more common in people who are 65 years or older uh, than patients with GB, uh, glioblastoma. Another point that I would highlight is that the survival for patients with GBM is typically still uh, 12 to 18 months, uh, whereas most patients who develop a diagnosis, a clinical diagnosis of dementia or cognitive impairment, typically live for another decade after diagnosis. Uh, so this is a much more common problem than glioblastoma. Another thing that is a problem both within radiology and actually in our referring services is the sense of futility. Uh, for making this diagnosis uh, because there aren't great treatments available, and hopefully that will change in the near future. Uh, but I wanted to review uh, quickly some of the reasons that it's helpful to make this diagnosis. First of all, a lot of these patients come into the emergency room for other supposed reasons like fall, um, altered mental status. They often have little or no cognitive reserve, so a change in medication can put them into a sense of delirium. Uh, cutting down on the ED workups for these patients is very uh, helpful for both the families, the patients, and uh, healthcare cost. Um, diagnosing early can certainly allow individual patients to participate in planning their future, uh, both in terms of how they want to be treated, uh, how they handle their estate, uh, making choosing healthcare proxies, etc. Um, it can explain behaviors that are atypical for that individual, both to the, the patient, their family members, or others. Um, certainly, many of these uh, diseases, unfortunately, have a genetic uh, risk components of making a diagnosis, and one individual may uh, educate other family members of their own risk. Um, just like any other aspect of medicine, uh, which I think most of us are familiar with for some reason, uh, knowing a diagnosis and not having ambiguity uh, can be very reassuring and helpful to everyone involved. Um, another reason is that uh, people who have cognitive impairment or dementia actually drive like teenage boys. Um, they are very dangerous on the road. Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes they um, get in fatal car accidents, and sometimes those fatal car accidents don't just involve the uh, individual driver. Um, so reducing this risk is helpful from a population perspective. As I'll talk about again in another slide as well, those emails uh, trying to uh, fish for uh, your savings accounts are often more intended for people who are cognitively impaired and can't recognize uh, a scam. Uh, and here, just an example of that. Um, the other reason, uh, even though therapies aren't necessarily very effective yet, uh, if recognizing it early uh, is a way to enroll people when they are more likely to benefit from uh, therapies, particularly if they turn out to be effective. 
Uh, so again, these are all reasons to try to make a diagnosis early. How do these patients present? Um, they often are living alone or with other people of the same age. It may be that uh, the son or daughter or other loved one recognizes that the patient can no longer follow a phone conversation or they're repetitive. Uh, people come home for the holidays and recognize that mom is very different than she was six or 12 months ago. Um, Sometimes we have in New York uh, people who are in finance uh, who suddenly can't file their taxes anymore, so we often get a little bump in uh, dementia imaging referrals in April and May. Um, like I said before, that Nigerian prince emailing you to borrow some money is purposely misspelling words not to uh, reveal themselves to someone like you, uh, but their point is to try to filter out and recognize people who are, are unable to recognize uh, scams. Uh, and so these scams are actually intended more for people with impairment. Um, I love to make fun of cardiologists as a radiologist, and it's uh, surprising how often you see patients who have beautifully managed hypertension, uh, cholesterol, uh, elevated cholesterol, or other coronary artery uh, disease risk factors, um, but no comment on their cognitive abilities. And of course, cardiovascular risk factors are also risk factors for developing dementia. We can't spare a radiologist either. Um, if you start paying attention to some of the things I'll show you later in this talk, uh, you will start seeing atrophy patterns that are suggestive of dementia in many of the head CTs that we're reading for people over the age of 65. Um, again, uh, patients don't often come in saying, I have uh, low frequency word finding difficulty. Um, these people are often living alone in relative isolation. They're retired. They're under very low cognitive demand. Uh, and they may also be living with someone else who may be in the early stages of cognitive impairment, uh, making detection much harder. How do these people typically present? Um, these are some of the common things that we might see in a radiology report. Um, these can be very um, ambiguous. Uh, word finding difficulty uh, can have many different meanings, as we'll get to later in this talk. Um, but these are some of the common things, and I always think that if my dementia refer saw me um, dictate or perhaps give this lecture, they would think that I had a primary progressive aphasia. Um, you have to keep in mind that many of the referrers are uh, maybe not trained in recognizing dementia. Uh, they are not necessarily interested, uh, and just like other uh, specialties like ourselves, everyone is under a lot of intense time pressure. It's very difficult to evaluate someone for cognitive impairment uh, during a five-minute clinical visit, uh, and so uh, the referral uh, history may not be particularly helpful. And I just re I'll come back to this as well, but the uh, clinical presentation uh, can sometimes differ both from the uh, postmortem autopsy report uh, and research studies that have been published, uh, or it could differ from the radiology uh, images. And so uh, I think everyone involved uh, should be aware that there are these discordances uh, that can occur. Uh, he, this is sort of the typical thing that we have been training uh, people for for the last 30 years. Uh, when we image for dementia, the role of radiology has been largely to exclude other etiologies. And I show you an example here of a patient with rapidly progressive dementia. Uh, Refer actually thought this patient might have CJD, uh, but they actually had a glioblastoma in the left temporal pole. Um, so we are certainly looking for masses. Um, other things that we might look for is hydrocephalus, particularly uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is somewhat treatable, uh, or extensive white matter disease, which can be associated with a, a diagnosis that's currently called vascular cognitive impairment. Um, I won't actually spend uh, much time talking about these for the rest of this talk. I, I want to emphasize more uh, learning to recognize low bar specific atrophy patterns that may suggest an underlying diagnosis. Uh, and I think if we pay attention to these and use some of the selected uh, keyhole images that I'm going to show you, uh, you may become much more sensitive uh, for these uh, etiologies. Um, this is the NYU protocol, um, and um, this is an order that we typically use, particularly for patients who are more impaired. Uh, it is worth thinking about strategically which sequence is the most useful because you, they may not stay still in the magnet for very long. Um, and I think a 3D volumetric sequence is most helpful. I prefer the T1 over a, a T2 or flare volumetric sequence because 
the superficial layers of cortex actually have a short or longer T2. Uh, and so sometimes it sort of exaggerates the appearance of atrophy because the, the superficial layers look like CSF. Um, the flare can be very helpful for recognizing uh, white matter disease, particularly when it's pretty dominant. Um, the other sequences are more for sort of um, specific findings. Uh, but if I only got one sequence, I would go for the 3D volumetric T1. Another uh, thing that I would encourage you to sort of perhaps think about whether you should continue to do it is uh, just describing things as age-related volume loss. And uh, hopefully you've had the experience of seeing a 70 or 80 year old whose brain looks like they're 30. Um, age-related volume loss is actually not particularly um, common or uh, significant over a pretty long period of time. And there are some older papers that support that. Uh, here, uh, a reference from the 1970s. Um, I particularly like this graph, uh, which is showing you uh, volume loss in gray matter and white matter uh, over uh, a normal lifespan or even longer lifespan between uh, ages of 20 and 100. And I think the first thing to, to note about this is that there's a pretty uh, small change in volume over time, uh, especially in the white matter. Uh, but the gray matter is probably where the action is. And so if you take anything from this talk or this slide, uh, I would encourage you to start focusing more on cortical volume loss and gray matter volume loss than the uh, global, uh, since a lot of the volume is from the white matter. Um, and the other thing is that if we just look at the red and blue here, uh, the red is dementia of Alzheimer's type, which was the term that was used at the time in this paper. What you notice is that in these elderly individuals who had dementia of Alzheimer's type, there isn't a significant uh, sort of discord or separation between normal and disease. Uh, and this is when we look at global gray matter, white matter volume loss. And I think this supports what I'm going to tell you in the remainder of this talk, that you should be focusing on gray matter volume loss, but also in a sort of low bar specific pattern. And uh, there is a differential for global volume loss, which I think many of us are familiar with. Um, I've listed those here. Uh, many of these may be things that would be uh, available or known uh, to the provider. Uh, one that you may be less familiar with is uh, listed here as the fifth uh, uh, bullet item, is that uh, other chronic neurodegenerative diseases, such as multiple sclerosis or seizure disorder, uh, can also cause um, global or near global volume loss, uh, and we have to be careful uh, when we read those. Uh, so uh, one of my favorite papers, uh, which really highlights uh, one of the problems within radiology, is uh, this paper where uh, a pretty well-known institution, uh, the neurologist who specialized in dementia, retrospectively looked at 40 patients with uh, confirmed uh, frontotemporal lobar degeneration. And when they looked at those radiology reports, what they realized was that only 10% of those reports suggested the underlying diagnosis. What's interesting is if they then asked the neuroradiologist to retrospectively look at the studies for uh, the atrophy pattern associated with uh, FTLD, uh, they were pretty good at recognizing it. And so I think this kind of highlights um, not only that Many of us are not paying enough attention to uh, low bar specific volume loss, but that many of us are also a little wary of reporting it. And I think this is uh, partly from a lack of knowledge of what uh, different patterns can look like, uh, but also that sense of futility that many of us feel uh, the history may be uh, not very good. Uh, and we are uh, weary of suggesting this diagnosis in a report. It's similar to saying that someone has HIV. Um, it is a pretty um, uh, depressing thing to see in a report. Um, but again, I, hopefully I've convinced you that it can be very helpful to patients and their families uh, if you highlight that there may be something going on that needs further workup. Um, so now I'm going to talk about what I consider sort of the key images to focus on uh, to recognize low bar specific atrophy. And these uh, nine or ten images are, um, you can be rather efficient. Uh, it doesn't take a long amount of time uh, to look. Uh, and so hopefully this will be helpful to everyone. Many of you are uh, probably already familiar with looking at the temporal lobes. Um, this is a healthy 30-year-old volunteer. Um, perhaps at the lateral geniculate level. Um, what I would encourage you to start doing is also uh, using that same coronal plane, but move forward and ideally sort of where the sphenoid wing uh, begins. 
uh, to look at the temporal poles. And this view on the left actually allows you to sort of compare the frontal uh, anterior insula and temporal lobes uh, to each other, uh, but also between right and left. And if we scroll further back, uh, this view in particular I find very helpful. Uh, same coronal orientation now coming straight up from the transverse sinuses. And what you're able to do here is look at the occipital and parietal lobes uh, simultaneously. And I'll show you an example of why that can be very helpful in a minute. Other views I like is to scroll up uh, to the hand knob. You can see the patient's left inverted three here quite well. This view allows you to see the frontal and parietal lobes in comparison, uh, again, left and right. And then if we scroll down, we can do this sort of oblique axial view straight through the hippocampal bodies. And particularly with the flares, I'll show you in a minute, this can be a very helpful sequence if you're sort of questioning whether there's hippocampal atrophy. Another view that many of you may not be familiar with is to focus on the parasagittal views. And I in particular like this left parasagittal view. A lot of dementia seem to occur earlier. Uh, the atrophy occurs earlier on the left side. And so here we're about 5 to 10 millimeters left of uh, midline. And this view allows us to see the frontal, parietal, and occipital lobes in a single image. And sometimes this can be tremendously helpful for recognizing atrophy. Um, I also like to look at the left and right uh, compared to one another. Uh, so here we're sort of using a parasagittal view that is uh, through the Heschel's gyrus uh, comparing right and left. Um, it's surprising how often uh, asymmetries are missed, uh, but as I'll show you later, uh, it can be quite striking, uh, particularly if you consciously look for it. Uh, again, this is a healthy control. Um, this is just an example. Uh, this is sort of textbook examples of two different types of dementia uh, using that left parasagittal view. Uh, and we can see on the left uh, also that there's a fair bit of motion in the scan, uh, but we see uh, sort of prominence of the medial frontal gyrus and uh, cingulate uh, area uh, compared to the right where we see sort of posterior cingulate and precuneus uh, sulco prominence that is disproportionate to other areas. Uh, I'd also just draw your attention on the image on the left that the corpus callosum, particularly in FTLD, uh, will show focal thinning of the anterior body genuine rostrum, and we can see that in the image we see here. Uh, motion on sequences also sometimes can be helpful. Uh, certain types of dementia patients typically don't like to hold still for very long. Uh, so we'll come back to this, but this is just a nice example of, of what can be uh, done with a single left parasagittal image in certain uh, patients. Um, like I said, for whole brain atrophy or, or diffuse atrophy, there is a differential for lobar specific atrophy uh, besides underlying neurodegenerative conditions. And here I've shown you an example of a patient with a pretty severe uh, ICA stenosis and decreased perfusion in the left hemisphere. Um, there, the differential that I've listed on the right is usually pretty obvious, uh, you know, maybe with a patient who's had chemo radiation that you're not aware of or chronic epilepsy or MS. Um, but in general, these um, patients, the history is usually pretty obvious. Uh, so I think this is sort of an academic differential, but it's worth uh, remembering it. Um, so how do I read these studies? And uh, basically, I do what we all normally do, which is look for a mass, hydrocephalus, uh, some kind of uh, quantitative or semi-quantitative uh, description of the white matter hyperintensities that may be present. Uh, but then I look at these keyhole images. Um, and I want to talk briefly about using quantitative uh, volumetric reports, which have become popular, uh, particularly to our referrers, and how they may mislead us sometimes. Uh, we have to be, you know, there's a reason to have a radiologist interpret those. Uh, and so what we're going to do now is go through a series of cases uh, once we talk about quantitative volumetrics uh, and highlight how uh, the sort of classic findings for different diagnoses. Uh, first, I just want to talk about quantitative volumetrics. And so that typically the way this works, uh, I don't mean to pick on one company over another, but this is one that we used to use. Uh, where they segment out uh, different areas of the brain based on a volumetric T1. Uh, they generate a report uh, that uh, compares that patient's volumes to uh, normative data uh, that they have. Uh, and here in this example uh, that I'm showing you, uh, supposedly the uh, volumes of the right and left hippocampi are below the fifth percentile compared to age match controls. 
And uh, that's shown here as well in the upper right of that uh, display. Um, and again, there is a differential for hippocampal volume loss, just like we talked about for whole brain or low bar specific volume loss. These are some of the most common reasons. Um, the point I would like to make uh, or emphasize is that many different dementias actually cause hippocampal volume loss. And of course, uh, prior hemispheric injury, either from trauma, stroke, uh, surgery, or a seizure disorder can also cause uh, hippocampal volume loss. Uh, the other point to make here is that uh, being in the 12th or 10th percentile uh, may be the way that people were born. Um, and so we have to be careful uh, not to, uh, you know, sort of just call that dementia every time. It could be um, a normal value for that individual. Uh, certainly change over time, uh, decrease over time that is relatively rapid, I think is more specific for a underlying uh, neurogenitive condition. Um, or, you know, somebody who is very, um, has very high educational attainment, chances are if they come in with a 10th percentile, uh, that was not what they were, were like when they were 20 years old. And uh, there are some problems with segmentation, and uh, different companies have different ways of dealing with this. Um, again, I'm not trying to pick on any uh, particular vendor, uh, but T1-based uh, volumetrics uh, can have problems with segmentation because the T1 values of bone, air, and CSF are identical. Uh, and so segmentation in certain areas can be problematic. Um, here on the right, I took that same 30-year-old volunteer that I showed you earlier, uh, with a series of images, and I, I told her, don't drink too much, stay hydrated, and let's image you, you know, on every single scanner we have over the next two weeks. And what you can see here is that her hippocampal volumes uh, did vary over time uh, using different scanners, uh, and there is some uh, variation uh, that is unavoidable. Uh, my personal experience is that uh, this variation is less uh, problematic in elderly individuals, uh, but it's another thing to keep in mind uh, when you use these reports. Um, other limitations, um, we actually had problems at first because the volumetric program was going so fast it was actually trying to read data that hadn't even been complete uh, and was clipping the data, so another thing to watch for. Um, I personally also would suggest uh, that you ask them where their normative data is coming from. Uh, many of the companies are reluctant uh, to um, share with you where their normative data is really coming from, uh, and that can certainly bias the results. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about uh, a series of cases for relatively common uh, neurodegenerative conditions. Uh, here, the first one, uh, the history was memory loss. And uh, here we're looking at that oblique axial view with flare. Uh, through the hippocampi, and what I personally see here is I can see the entire temporal horn in a single image. The hippocampi are appear atrophied with smooth lateral margins, uh, and the flare signal is a little bit brighter than I'm used to seeing. And it, it that may be specific to our protocol, uh, but it's something to pay attention to uh, as you look at these studies. Uh, the coronal view also shows uh, some prominence of the temporal horns. Uh, for me personally, the axial view is often much more helpful. Um, here's the volumetric report. I think I showed you this earlier. It's the same patient. Uh, again, I confirm that the segmentation looks correct. And then I look at the uh, report showing that this patient is below the 5th percentile compared to age match controls. I use these more as a supplement to feel more confident, particularly in ambiguous cases. If we go back and use that coronal view through the transverse sinuses shown here on the left side of the screen, uh, we get again a view of the parietal and occipital lobes in a single image. Uh, and we also see that left parasagittal view on the right that I actually showed you earlier. Uh, and I often tell residents or fellows to think about how many coins you can stick in these sulci. Um, but if I now label this, we can see again on the right what I showed you before that there is sort of more prominent atrophy in the posterior cingulate and precuneus. On the image on the left, uh, the line is going through the parietal occipital fissure, and what we see is that the sulci are particularly prominent above that level. The parietal lobes can be a little bit tricky because people actually get volume loss, particularly in the superior parietal lobule with aging. Uh, so what I encourage the trainees to do is to divide that area in half, uh, and I just call this the Tropic of Cancer because I'm Northern Hemisphere biased. 
Uh, but really what you want to see is atrophy in the below the dash line, above the uh, straight line. That sort of inferior half parietal lobe atrophy is more specific for uh, underlying neurodegenerative conditions. Um, I think um, Desican and all actually reported that. I don't have the reference here, um, but this is a, the upper areas can be affected just by age. Uh, so be a little bit wary of that, and I label that here as well. Um, you can see biparietal atrophy in patients with chronic uh, epilepsy or multiple sclerosis as well. So this patient actually had uh, bitemporal biparietal volume loss with a history of memory loss. Uh, we suggested that this may, um, you know, suggest increased risk for underlying Alzheimer's disease pathology. And we'll talk about how we report these findings at the end. Uh, second case actually uh, kind of has a similar history. Um, a little bit younger patient uh, with more subjective memory complaints. And if you look at these images uh, for a minute, I think most of us would probably let this slide. Um, we may, um, you know, given that I'm giving a dementia lecture, you probably are thinking, oh no, there's hippocampal volume loss here. But I think normally most of us would probably not think about this. Uh, and I think this is an example of how uh, the quantitative volumetric report can also be misleading or falsely reassuring uh, in that it actually says this individual is in the uh, 50th percentile compared to age match controls. Um, but if you pay attention to the sort of more superior aspect of the image on the right, uh, there is some sulcal prominence that is probably more than one would like to see in a 55-year-old. And if we go and look at the uh, parasagittal image, uh, the middle image here showing you that coronal view that I like so much, and then we go up towards the vertex, we now see, uh, even though the hippocampi are not that impressive, uh, that there is pretty striking uh, biparietal volume loss in this 55-year-old individual. Uh, in my experience, uh, patients with this diagnosis often... Uh, especially on a qualitative basis, it's hard to recognize the atrophy pattern if you overly focus on the hippocampal regions. Uh, and that a lot of these patients with early onset Alzheimer's disease will often have more obvious uh, biparietal volume loss that is out of proportion uh, to what one would expect for someone in their 50s and 60s. Uh, so again, using the, the volumetric report, uh, blindly without thinking about it or understanding the underlying uh, diseases can get you into trouble. Uh, so this was an example of early onset AD, uh, subsequently had an amyloid positive scan. Uh, next case is uh, something uh, slightly different. Uh, word finding difficulty can mean a lot of different things. Uh, and again, those referring physicians may not be uh, world experts in aphasias. Uh, they may not have time or uh, the motivation or interest to really assess the type of language impairment that the patient has. Uh, so often the imaging can be very helpful. Uh, and what we're seeing here, I think, is uh, something that I personally years ago probably would not have recognized. Uh, but with experience, I've learned that this is a significant finding, uh, that we're seeing um, disproportionate focal atrophy in the left inferior parietal lobule. And I've highlighted that for you here. Uh, most patients with uh, one of these types of diagnoses that we're going to talk about now will have disproportionate left-sided atrophy. Again, a reason I tell you to focus on the left side more than the right if you're uh, doing those sagittal images. And here's that sagittal comparison uh, more laterally. Um, this study had actually been read as, uh, I think, volume-related volume loss or normal. Uh, but it's when you look left versus right that it becomes very obvious that there is striking disproportionate atrophy in the language areas uh, of this individual. And uh, these are, um, this is one of a group of diagnoses that are referred to as primary progressive aphasias. Um, this review that I've cited here I think is excellent. Um, and the table is just a summary of the different primary progressive aphasias. I don't want to get into too much uh, detail for the sake of time, uh, but I would encourage you to read this if you're interested in this uh, diagnosis or syndrome, if you will. Uh, this person had logopenic aphasia, which is usually due to underlying Alzheimer's disease. It typically is most severe in the inferior parietal lobule. And one of the classic features on exam is that they have difficulty with repetition. Um, they will have word finding difficulty like many of us experience with tip of tongue phenomena. Uh, but it is so severe that it impairs normal communication. 
Another key point for primary progressive aphasia, and I'm going to show you another example in a second, is that the, the language impairment should really precede other areas of cognitive impairment by one to two years. Unfortunately, sometimes patients come to us many years later, and then it can be difficult to tell what the initial diagnosis was. Um, so here's another example. Uh, again, the history is often identical to what we see with different diagnoses. Um, this particular diagnosis has been uh, supposedly relatively uncommon. I think it's uncommon for radiologists to recognize that it is potentially present. Uh, and the reason is that uh, if you just use the axial images, you will miss this diagnosis more times than not. Um, but when you start to look at it in a right-left sagittal plane or you purposely come forward to that sphenoid wing view that I described to you earlier, it uh, becomes more obvious that this patient has pretty severe focal atrophy involving the left temporal pole. Often early on, the atrophy is more in the basal areas of the temporal lobe, so you have to look for it if you hear a history of word-finding difficulty. Um, this is semantic dementia. It's almost always on the left side. I won't describe what right-sided semantic dementia looks like clinically, um, but left-sided semantic dementia uh, usually involves the left temporal pole. Um, it is usually due to a TDP uh, pathology, um, but uh, TDP43 pathology um, rarely can be associated with Alzheimer's disease pathology in the literature. These patients will also describe word-finding difficulty, uh, but this is very different. Uh, these people... Uh, will not remember the, the meaning of words. Uh, and typically it starts with low frequency words. So they may still know what a dog or a cat is, uh, but they will forget what a lemur is. And it doesn't matter how many times you tell them, uh, they will not be able to, to use lemur correctly uh, in normal communication. The other curious thing that they get is they lose the ability to read sight words correctly. Uh, so some of you may have young children uh, in English, there are certain words that just don't sound the way that they should if you were going to sound them out phonetically. Uh, a great example of that is the word pint, like a pint of beer. Uh, patients who have this diagnosis will often mispronounce that word as pent, uh, and so they sort of lose the ability to pronounce exception words. Uh, here, just a different example of the same diagnosis, uh, again, just highlighting for you that it can be very focal. On the right, uh, I love this view, uh, and I call this the chi sign uh, because the, the temporal pole shrivels up into this sort of uh, s sort of X-like shape. Uh, but it, once you've seen it a couple times, you'll start to recognize it and realize you've probably been missing it for the last decade. Um, here, another example that I personally missed early on, uh, where the temporal lobe sometimes just sort of starts to droop off the sphenoid wing. And uh, this was read as normal on both of these studies. Uh, and it was only on the third uh, imaging study where the history was finally word-finding difficulty um, that we recognized that the uh, left temporal pole was starting to atrophy uh, disproportionate to the rest of the brain. Um, so this is another example of uh, semantic dementia. Um, another point to make, uh, again, highlighting that volumetrics can be helpful, but it can also mislead you if you read it blindly. Uh, this is actually, I think, from the second example that I showed you. Uh, where you have to remember that the volumetric program uh, generally combines the right and left hippocampi together uh, and gives you a, a global volume. And so this patient actually was within normal limits of 20th or 21st percentile. Uh, and it's only when you sort of dig into the data, uh, this is again from that same patient, and we look at the right versus the left volumes for the hippocampus that we see that the left hippocampal volume is at, actually out of proportion to everything else. Uh, so again, you have to be careful not to be misled uh, by combining right and left uh, with these volumetric reports. I'd also just point out that early in the disease, the hippocampus might not be that atrophied, and so the report may still be normal even if you account for asymmetry. Okay, so next uh, diagnosis here. Um, this is one of my uh, favorite referring clinicians, and this was a note uh, from his uh, visit. Um, a lot of these patients, uh, particularly on ABR exams or when we're teaching trainees, have uh, bizarre, unusual, and new behavior. Um, and I would just caution you that sometimes uh, patients with this diagnosis do the opposite, and they become kind of abulic, uh, lose interest in sort of normal hobbies and activities. Uh, in my own experience, it seems to be this sort of more subdued version of this diagnosis tends to be more common in women, uh, but that may just be that it's uh, poorly recognized. 
Um, and these people uh, will often have uh, atrophy that you have to kind of look for. Um, this is a more textbook example where we see on the image on the left uh, that the parietal lobes are relatively preserved. Uh, but then we see uh, sulcal prominence in the medial frontal area, or anterior cingulate in the middle image. Uh, and on the right, we see uh, pretty clearly the orbitofrontal sulci and the insula is certainly opening up. Uh, another finding that we can see sometimes, which is shown well in the middle image, is these finger-like areas of flare hyperintensity, which has been associated with the progranulin uh, mutation version of this disease. Uh, so when you see this sort of hazy flare abnormality sort of in the same areas as you see atrophy, I think that should also make you think that you may be dealing with a uh, frontotemporal lobar degeneration, or uh, in this case, like a PIX uh, variant or behavioral variant FTD. This is a, a different patient. I think I showed you these images earlier, but more uh, midline. Uh, this type of patient often will not hold particularly still because they are disinhibited. Um, again, you can see uh, atrophy in the medial frontal lobe on the image on the right, and the focal thinning of the corpus callosum is very clear here. Um, these are all findings that should make you feel comfortable that you're dealing with a behavioral variant FTD. Again, the volumetric report often will be abnormal. Um, so hippocampal atrophy does not always mean Alzheimer's disease. Remember that slide I showed you earlier that many atrophies can cause hippocampal volume loss. This is a different patient, uh, and I look for this. It's not specific for FTD, but it is pretty good at detecting frontal, insular, or temporal lobe volume loss. Often the um, anterior cingulate and the insular cortex will become disproportionately thin and flare hyperintense. Uh, the uh, insula often will get this sort of more jagged, uh, mountainous, uh, far west look, if you will, instead of looking like a sinusoidal uh, shape with hill-like architecture. It starts to look more uh, sharp and angular like mountains. Uh, and I think this can be very helpful to increase your confidence that you're dealing with a frontotemporal insular volume loss uh, and perhaps a FTLD. This last case uh, is an interesting one that, that really is a challenge for everyone that's involved. Uh, and here, uh, the history uh, often is sort of Parkinsonian. Uh, and these people will have a, a, a sort of cluster of symptoms that we'll talk about in a minute. But whenever you hear uh, tremor or gait abnormality with cognitive impairment, um, you should certainly, anytime you hear of these sort of Parkinsonian or, or motor-like uh, movement disorder type symptoms, you should be thinking of this diagnosis or one of the FTLDs. Uh, and here we see this sort of, um, I often describe it as sort of a ropey, sort of hard to pin down uh, type of atrophy. There's no clear lobar specific atrophy. Um, there is clearly some hippocampal volume loss, which isn't highly specific. Um, but in a 75-year-old, this is too much. Um, and so uh, in this case, we actually had a, an FTG PET. Uh, and truly, uh, the FTG PET is probably, um, if we don't, we're not talking about DAT scans, uh, is really the only imaging uh, finding that's specific for this diagnosis. And what we see in the bottom right, which is a mesial um, view of this cerebral hemisphere, is we see this area of green, which is hypometabolism in the medial occipital lobes. And we also see uh, lateral occipital lobe hypometabolism in the top left. Um, so occipital lobe hypometabolism makes us think of dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, these patients sometimes look uh, just like Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and I think um, our referrers uh, should know that we sometimes may uh, suggest Alzheimer's disease and be wrong and it be underlying dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, this is a nice table uh, summarizing uh, the frequency of these associated uh, features at diagnosis. Again, you can see that only about half of patients will report having uh, vivid uh, humanoid-like uh, hallucinations. Um, certainly, uh, it can be very helpful if you see that. Uh, but it won't always be present. So uh, if you hear a history of sleep disturbance, REM breakthrough disorder, uh, Parkinsonian uh, features, or sort of fluctuations in altered mental status, this is something that you should be thinking of. Um, again, atrophy in the occipital lobes, frankly, uh, is present sometimes and not other times. Uh, so it's not a very helpful thing to even look for, frankly. 
Um, it's really um, FTG PET or um, you know some people use DAT scans in this way, um, but this is a very challenging diagnosis to make uh, for everyone involved, not just for the radiologist. Uh, so again, that was a dementia with Lewy bodies. I summarized the, the five or six cases that I've shown here. Uh, this is just for you if you review these cases later. Um, I just want to show you a couple other slides to kind of drive uh, certain points in. Um, certain types of uh, neurodegenerative conditions often result in motion, uh, and in particular, this is the differential when I see a lot of motion degradation on the scan. Uh, the patient on the right, I actually all I had was the scalp uh, haste sequence uh, to make the diagnosis, but I think that I was pretty much done after I saw that uh, knife blade atrophy in the frontal poles. Um, there are, you frankly don't necessarily need an MRI if you're paying attention. Um, here, an example of a, a patient in the ED for fall uh, who actually had uh, left temporal pole atrophy, uh, again, showing what I call the Chi sign on the image on the far right. Um, it is actually not that hard to pick up these cases in the ED, and you will be surprised if you start paying attention to it. Again, in my opinion, uh, many dementia patients come into the ED for falls or altered mental status. They get worked up for UTI and pneumonia, uh, and the real underlying cause is that they really probably should not be living alone at home anymore. Um, and so I think there, it, it is helpful for the radiologist to at least report it if they see atrophy patterns that suggest further workup. Um, sometimes, as I mentioned, you may be limited to a scout sequence because the patient doesn't want to hold still. Uh, so here we see, um, again, it helps to look at multiple images to be sure this isn't just a, a slab-like artifact, uh, but a posterior cortical atrophy pattern in this patient. It often looks like 3 o'clock uh, sign, if you will. Uh, and here, just another example of the Chi sign in a patient with uh, semantic dementia. Um, certainly, when you see temporal pole atrophy like that, you should also consider other uh, forms of FTLD. Um, but when it's very focal there, it's usually due to SD. Um, if you teach neuroanatomy to med students and you're paying attention, you might start seeing atrophy patterns that also suggest uh, dementia. Here was an example from my uh, class in 2018 uh, of pretty clear uh, FTLD atrophy pattern. You can see on the right uh, that the parietal lobes and occipital lobes are relatively preserved, uh, but there is knife blade atrophy of the medial frontal gyrus. Um, and this was probably FTLD. We didn't do histology on it. So in summary, um, I just want to emphasize to you that there can be a discordance. I don't think I have a citation here, um, but it is not uncommon uh, to look at a series of patients who meet NIH criteria for a particular diagnosis and at autopsy some you know, 5 to 10% of them actually have a different underlying uh, diagnosis. Uh, so there is discordance between clinical uh, diagnosis and pathology. Uh, certainly that also exists uh, for imaging and pathology or imaging and clinical presentation. Um, this is partly, I think, because we still are not, you know, structural MR or FTG PET are not actually very specific for the underlying pathology. Uh, the clinical manifestations of disease may not always be uh, super specific, especially early on for the underlying pathology. Uh, we're still learning, uh, and I think um, we're trying to translate group-based differences into individual diagnoses. Um, I think it's care you, you need to be careful. Um, I think you will do a lot of good if you are very careful about suggesting uh, workup in certain patients, as I'll mention here in a second. Um, Jeff Petrella, I think, uh, reported this in radiology. I don't have the citation here, uh, but by paying attention to low bar specific atrophy, uh, our uh, diagnostic accuracy does improve. Uh, certainly combining it with an FTG PET can make that accuracy better. Um, as a radiologist, you there's a bit of an art to this in the sense that you have to understand your local referrers, um, the quality of the clinical history that you're getting, and how comfortable you are presenting or suggesting diagnoses. Uh, one way of thinking of this is a patient like this uh, who you know, in the first instance may come in with some completely different history like fall. Uh, and what I see here is bipartal bitemporal atrophy. Uh, and these are sort of the five choices that one might have uh, if you're going to act on that uh, atrophy pattern. Uh, for me, I would often put this in the findings. I might call the clinician and suggest to them, you know, hey, does this patient have cognitive impairment as well? Uh, but some of you may uh, feel differently about where you would fall into these uh, five action items. 
Uh, for me personally, though, if this history was actually memory loss, um, I would actually say uh, something like uh, bitemporal bipridal atrophy suggests increased risk for underlying Alzheimer's disease pathology. And again, that's my local uh, refers uh, being comfortable with that. Um, and I think it's worth uh, thinking about uh, the fact that patients now read reports. Um, we actually, in our PET MRI system, have a disclaimer that actually says that the imaging is only uh, you know, indicative or supportive of diagnoses and that the uh, referring physician uh, should uh, combine all the available information to establish a, a true clinical diagnosis. And so we're trying to emphasize that the patients need to talk to the referring physician uh, and not freak out if they see us describing certain atrophy patterns. Uh, last points, I uh, just want to emphasize again, it's really ultimately a clinical diagnosis, but there are many times when the radiologist can be helpful if they suggest that they see an atrophy pattern that would support further workup. Um, I would, would encourage you to pay attention to this in the next two weeks after you see this lecture. I think you'll be surprised how often you start to see patterns. Um, the quantitative volumetrics can be helpful, but be careful with it. It can certainly mislead you. Uh, and I personally am a little bit uh, biased, but I think if there's ambiguity, uh, often an FTG PET, uh, which is usually uh, paid for by Medicare uh, in elderly patients, uh, is a very easy way to uh, increase your confidence in, in a particular diagnosis. Uh, thank you.